as to get straight into the scripture for today. We're going to be reading from Philippians 4. If you want to turn there in your own Bible, I've got a Bible open here. I've got the notes here, and it's going to be on the screen. You can take out your cell phone, your tablet, or you can just read with us, whatever. But let's get into scripture. Scripture is so important. Um, Philippians 4, 10 to 13. Paul's writing, and he's saying, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do this through Him who gives me strength. So Lord, today we want to come and learn from you. Thank you, God, for your word that we can be instructed by, be changed by, be molded by, be bent by. So come and have your way amongst us here today as we open our hearts for your ministry. Amen. I'm going to, usually I first tell a story. Um, I like stories. I think uh, stories are good for us to connect with. But I want to give you my title straight away today. Because today I'm asking a simple question. Are you happy? Are you happy? Now, now, usually when this question is asked, let me just be real. Um, usually when this question is asked, it's, it's asked in, in quite a sarcastic way. It's like you've made a mistake, you broke something or something, or you crashed into someone accidentally, and the first they jump out of the car and are like, are you happy? No. Why, why, why would I be happy about this? You know, it's, it's usually, you know, people that's aggressive about something that went horribly wrong. And, and usually when it's asked, the, the, the real answer is obviously not. I'm not happy about this demise in relationship. I'm not happy about the fact that we just broke something. I'm not happy about, you know, the fact that the church was closed during COVID, you know, because people thought I was happy about that, you know. No, my heart is church. I, I live and breathe church. No, I'm not happy about it. And, and on... Other circumstances, I think we're afraid to ask the question. We're, we're a little bit afraid to ask our, our spouses, are you happy in this marriage? You know? Because th- there's, there's an accepted answer, right? <laughs> and and then, then we're afraid of the possible answer, you know? Not always. I'm not saying you're not happy. I'm very happy in my marriage. Are you happy at your job? Are you happy in, in this life? Are, are, you, are you happy in this church? That's, that's a tough question to ask. Can we be real? Because I think a lot of people don't live in a state of happiness. Now, now don't get me wrong at all. And you will see through the sermon, I'm not at all saying that happiness is the goal. All right? Happiness is not the goal. Happiness is a fleeting emotion. Because one moment you could be happy yesterday when you unwrapped your Christmas present and it's exactly what you wanted, you know, and you were happy. And then this morning... Your, your husband took too long to brush his hair, um, and you were getting late for church, and now all of a sudden, that nice new present you got, that necklace or whatever he gave you, all of a sudden, is just not shiny enough anymore. Happiness is not the goal. Happiness is a consequence. Happiness is what happens in our lives because something else is in place. And it's so amazing that, that in the Scripture... Paul's pretty much saying, hey, you can be happy. Pretty much saying that that I've learned how to be happy, how to be content, not be influenced by the circumstances around me as 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 much as I'm influenced by what is happening in me. Not to be influenced as much by, by whether I have plenty or nothing, but to be influenced by something that has changed in my heart. Because as much as we might say, yeah, hun, I'm happy, I see a lot of people incredibly influenced by this world. And if you're wondering what I mean by that, is it's those infomercials. Just buy this mop and you'll be happy. Don't mop like your grandmother. And then it's like this. I don't know. <laughs> no one's ever mopped like that, Tony. No one. Um, but you need the new mop. And if you get that mop, you'll be happy. And you dropped a couple of hints with your husband, with your wife for this mop for Christmas. I don't know if a mop is your dream, but maybe maybe you follow the the world and saying, if you you just get a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a husband, a wife, then you'll be happy. If you just have kids, then you'll be happy. Amen to that, though. Can Can I just say my kids make me very happy? But anyway, if you just... If you, just, if you just buy this, if you just buy this, then you'll be happy. If you just, if you just get that new car, you know, that, that 
Bucky or whatever, or a car, a car, you'll be happy. This, this, is, this is what's going to make you happy. This is what you have been missing. If you go to that destination, you know, I don't know where people are going these days, Fiji, Taiwan, I don't know. If you just go there on holiday, then, then you'll be happy. If you just vote for this political party, or just don't vote for that political party, then you'll be happy. If you just get the jab, or don't get the jab, then, then you'll be happy. Man, and we fall for these empty promises again and again. We do. And I see it. I see people going after these things, these, these empty promises that the world makes. But, but listen, I just want, I'm going off, off notes here for a little bit. But, but I know that one of the biggest tactics the enemy uses to derail us is empty promises. It absolutely is. It promises you that if you've got enough finances, everything will go well. You can't get sick if you're rich, Right? There's no such thing as illness if you've got enough money, right? Cars don't break down if you've got money. It says, oh, yeah, yeah, but if you just, if you just, and we fall for it. And a lot of people are living in a state of unhappiness because they're expecting circumstances to feed their joy. A lot of people are living in destruction of themselves because, man, we are too influenced by what this world has done to us, is doing to us, or what we might anticipate this world is going to do to us one day. And the reason I want to talk about this and the reason I want to end the year on this note is because I believe each and every one of us can find contentment in this life. I believe each and every one of us can get to this place where Paul was when he says, well, I've learned the secret, some translations say. I've learned the secret to be content. I've got this down. And in this passage, I want to give us two key things, two very, very key things to being happy. Isn't that, isn't that good? Who wants to be happy? Can we just see, is there anyone like, Hein, uh, like, are you happy? Not at the moment, but I think I'm, I want this. I want what you're talking about. I've been a bit bitter against everyone that don't want to do things my way. I've been a bit bitter that you don't want to preach the messages I want to hear. I've been a, but happiness, that's something I can get on board with. Well, I'm going to start somewhere where Paul technically doesn't start, but it's such a lesson in this scripture. And the first thing we see here is Paul is writing this letter to the Philippian church. Why? Because he received a gift from them. He received something from them. So he's writing to them and he's saying, hey, I'm so glad. I'm so, so, so glad that you guys, you know, had the chance to, to bless me to give me this gift. Now you'll notice what he says is you restored, you know, that you once again, you renewed your concern for me. And then he says, no, no, but actually you were always concerned about me. You just didn't have a way to show it. And I think that is so, so important. Now, now in their day, they didn't have WhatsApp video call. Praise God for technology, for real. So, so it was a little bit difficult to show concern, especially in a church that was struggling, in the Philippian church when they were struggling. Yet Paul writes and he says, listen, I'm so, so glad that you had a way to show your concern. And when you hear that, you can't help but go to the book of Acts where Paul is saying, Acts chapter 20, it's going to be on the screen, chapter 20, verse 35. And Paul is saying, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, he quotes Jesus saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And this word blessed is very interesting because this word blessed is the word makarion um, in, in Greek, and it means to be happy. Huh? It means to be fortunate. It is happy to give. And this is one of the secrets to happiness that we miss because you, you'll notice something, that when the world tells you what you need to be happy, it's always about what you can receive, not about what you can give. Huh? If you just do this, if you just do that, and none of it is actually about, hey, let's give, let's give. And we think that's what's going to make us happy in churches as well. Can I, can I for a moment talk about church? We think if we just find a church that gives me what I want, I'll be happy. And all of a sudden, you're in the wrong spot. You're in the wrong spot. I'm preaching to the converted. I know you guys are here, you know. A few of us here on Christmas, or the day after Christmas, but you guys are here. But, but once you fall into that trap of I need to receive to be happy, it's going to be difficult to get out. No. Happiness is found in giving of yourself. 
And I love that it starts like this because one of the reasons why giving is so good is because giving helps us get of that, out of that self-pity pit that we often find ourselves in, that, that self-pity pit, the poor me pity pit. You know, try and say that time 10 times faster, the poor me pity pit. You know? And we get in there and we're like, poor me. No one notices me. No one thinks about me. Poor me. But as soon as we start giving, it helps us lift our eyes out of that poor me, pity, pit that we might find ourselves in. Because then it's not about me anymore. It's not about me anymore. And it's interesting that, they, that Paul says, he, he reiterates it, he says, you had no way of showing it. But I think sometimes we use that as an excuse. Hun, I don't have anything to give, right? I want to give, but I don't, I don't, I'm not rich. Like everyone else in this world, poor me, pity, pity. It's only me that struggles. You got time. You got hands. How blessed is it to receive a written note? Who, who, when last did you guys receive a handwritten note from someone? There is not as much. that I still have a, have a box full of written notes that people have written me over the years. I really do. I have it. I keep it. Because it means something. It costs them nothing. And I think sometimes we're lazy. Jeez, pastor, relax. Because we don't look for excuses to bless others. We don't look for it. When last did you look for an excuse to bless your wife, to make her feel good, to give, to show your concern for her, your family, your friends, your kids, your church, your pastor? Ah, please, now I'm going to get like 100 letters this week. This is, not, this is not what this is about at all. Give your husband, your wife, 100 letters this week instead. Because I think a lot of us struggle with happiness because we're just a little bit too selfish. Because we think it is more blessed to receive than to give. So the first thing Paul does here is, is he shows that, or he, he confirms this thing, that there is... There is real happiness in giving. Because this giving thing doesn't just show that we are giving or generous people, but it actually proves three distinct things. It proves that God's relationship with us is now not just working in us, but through us. Something has permeated so much that it's not just about me anymore. It shows that we really care about those around us. And third, it shows that we are willing to sacrifice of ourselves. And when we do this, what happens is we start coming into alignment with our design. Okay, because the Bible is pretty clear that we should die to self. We've all read that. The Bible is pretty clear that we should honor others above ourselves. And when we start living this kind of life, this kind of giving life, what happens is we are coming into alignment with what God, what God did, what God said. Sorry about that. And then we start seeking the kingdom of God first. Let's recognize where I'm going with this. And then God starts adding everything else to us. Because all of a sudden, God's kingdom, we are in alignment with it, and we're seeking that first with everything in us. I cannot tell you enough. You don't, you don't have to be rich. You don't. I'm not suggesting going and emptying out your bank account. If you do want to do that, I'll give you my personal banking details. Um, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm talking about looking for a way to show concern. I'm showing, just showing that, man, I care. Let me tell you, there's a lot of hurting people in this world that could use a letter, a hug. Just hug them where I can't see, because if I can see it, I have to stop it. You know, it's COVID. Some people just need a little bit of concern. And I want to get into the, the, the meteor, the main part. Get ready for it. Because then Paul goes on to say that I've, I've mastered extremes of life. I've mastered the extremes of life. And I think this is so important because mastering the extremes is what, he, what he's saying when he says, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be happy. It doesn't matter what I have or don't have. I've learned to be happy. I've learned to be content in these situations because guess what? My contentment is not about how much your church or the church can do for me. This is literally what he was saying. He was writing to the church in Philippi. And he's saying, even when you couldn't give anything, I was still happy. I was still happy because it's not about the external situations or circumstances we face. Paul was saying, hey, there's something else at play here. 
There's something else incredibly, incredibly important. And we need to learn how to manage these extremes, to master these extremes, because it's the extremes that get us. It's the extremes of being in need. Where you feel like no one cares. God doesn't care. Look at me. How can I be in a place like this? But even more dangerous than need is plenty. It really is. So when you have plenty, you forget about God altogether. You don't need Him. You've got what you need. You've got what you need. And either of these extremes put us in, it puts us in a very dangerous place. It puts us in a very, very dangerous place. And if we don't learn how to master the extremes, and I'm going to get to how we're going to do that in a moment, and it's going to be simple, and, and you, you know exactly where I'm going with this, but I'm going to go there anyway. I want to tell you a story. A story that I've had to rehearse a bunch of times because it makes me cry every time. I want, to, I want to warn you. The flood is coming. All right. But it's a story about a man called Horatio Spafford. You might recognize that name. An incredible man. It's not going to be on the screen. You're going to have to just listen. Horatio Spafford was a, he was a lawyer in, um, in Chicago uh, during the 1870s, early 1800s, there around about in the 1800s. He was a very successful lawyer, by the way, a very rich man, up until the Chicago fires of 1871, where most of his finances was actually invested in property, which is a difficult thing when everything burns down. And he pretty much lost everything. So Horatio Spafford, he, he kept on practicing. He was actually um, a leader of the, the Presbyterian Church. He was the, the head lawyer of, of a firm. I mean, he was doing very well for himself. And two years after the fire, he decided to go on a holiday trip to England with his family. And um, unfortunately, actually what happened is, and I read the whole story again this morning, and what actually happened is there were some zoning issues on one of his contracts, and he had to stay behind a little bit to fix all those issues. So he sent his wife and, and um, children along, four kids, four daughters, he sent along on the ship, and they, he was going to meet them there as soon as he was done with the work that he had to do, um, because he just had to finish that, but they were on their way to his good friend Moody, who was preaching in England, and, and he was just going to get some encouragement. And they boarded the ship, the ship called, uh, I don't want to miss that, but Ville du, ha du Haver. I'm sorry if I'm messing that up, but, but they boarded that ship, his wife and four daughters. And on their way to England, something went horribly wrong and their ship got rammed by another ship. And cut in half, yeah. And all the chaos, you know, one of the, the moss fell down or something fell down, knocked his wife unconscious, and she later woke up on like a piece of driftwood raft kind of a thing, miraculously survived it. But she also watched all four of her daughters being swept away to sea and drown. All four of them. So when she eventually got to England, when she got to, I think they like washed up at Wales or something like that, but when they got there, she just wired him the message, saved alone. Imagine, imagine getting that message. So obviously Horatio boards the first ship he can find going to England and um, on his way there now, now this man has suffered tremendous financial loss, suffered losing everything actually. Going to find some encouragement and all four of his daughters die on their way there. His wife saved alone. And on his way there, he writes a song inspired by God, I've lifted by the Spirit of God. He writes the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And those lines says that, that the first verse, it starts and it says, when peace like a river attendeth my way and when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot." Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. The secret to happiness has almost nothing to do with what is happening to us, but everything what is happening in us. The secret to happiness is not the circumstances we face. Because if someone like Horatio could say in a situation he was facing, it is well with my soul, even though everything else was falling apart, there's something bigger to this. 
Now, now, again, I'm not saying it's not going to be difficult. I'm not saying we're not going to face tough times. Not at all. I'm saying there's a way to find contentment no matter what circumstance you face, no matter how wronged you feel. Even if you feel, Han, I should be there and I'm here. Man, that's got almost nothing to do with the contentment that you can experience in your soul. And Paul lays this line on us and he drops it like a bomb and he says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Because the secret to contentment is Christ. That is how we find contentment. You might say, Hein, that's rich, that's rich, not a chance. That is truth. That is truth. Now, when I say having Christ, it is important to understand I say have Christ. Because you're saying, Hein, I'm discontent, and I thought I had Jesus. But, but listen, I'm going to get real for a moment. I'm going to warn you this is going to get strict. Some of us treat Jesus like that old crocheted blanket that we received as babies, and we stuff him in a cupboard <laughs> out of reach. Maybe dust them off for Christmas time. When I say have Jesus, I don't mean a Jesus that you, when you, when you discover him, you forgot that you had him. Now I'm talking about a Jesus that is front and center in your life. I'm talking about a relationship that is your first point of contact. I'm talking about a Christ that is so real to you, so evident to you, you are willing to sacrifice everything. That is how you find contentment. Horatio went on to be a very successful businessman, a big blessing wherever he went, having more kids, or at least one more daughter that I know of, I don't know about more. But no matter what circumstances he found himself in, no matter what circumstances Paul found himself in, they could say it is well with my soul because their souls were in the right hands. And this morning, I want to end off this year by, by saying that if you want to be happy, make sure you place your soul in a place where it is safe. Where even when everything falls apart, even when you have nothing left, even, even if you lose absolutely everything, that we too can get to that place where we can say, God, it is well with my soul because I have you. And you are enough. So Lord, this morning, as we end off this year, 2021, we realize that there will be millions of circumstances and things in our lives that we cannot control. There will be millions of storms that we're going to have to face. There's going to be, there's going to be so many opportunities to get derailed. But Father, this morning, we want to come and renew your place in our lives. And say, Jesus, we want you front and center. Above anything you can do, we want you. We want relationship with you. Because Lord, even when difficulty might come in our lives, or, or maybe even times of, of plenty where we might forget about you, God, we we understand that contentment is not found in circumstances. It's not found in, in the situations around us. It is found in you. So help us, Holy Spirit, to remember that we can be happy when we focus on you. We can find contentment, true contentment, in any circumstance when you are our focus. So I want to thank you, Lord, for this year and everything you did, every miracle that you performed to keep us safe, keep us alive. I want to thank you that you blessed us with a church, with family, with friends. I want to thank you, Lord, that we have so much to be grateful for. But most of all, above everything else, I want to thank you that we truly can have a relationship with you. And I pray that as we go into this new year, that you would have the honor seat in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.